Hypocrisy. What's up, guys? Welcome to Lost Mining the Interwebs. I'm your host, Nick Kato for Kato Law. Small law firm in central Minnesota. One that does not know, after all these years, how to use a microphone and a microphone interface, apparently. So uh, there's a button. It's giant. Well, it's not giant. It's actually kind of small. I guess it depends on your perspective. It's not a large button, but it is a red button. And it's backlit naturally, or like, passively, I should say. Until you press it, then it's more actively backlit. But it's not that bright. And I look down and there you go. It uh it wasn't that it wasn't that it was on. It was the mute button was on. It was on, okay? It was on. There's not there's no way around it. There's nothing else I could say. The mute button was on. I just didn't think it was. How you doing guys? Welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh I was saying before to the to nothing the void uh sorry sorry that uh the show's a little later starting today had some um wonderful help with the children uh overnight so that's cool tonight tonight overnight and um i just <clears throat> zonked out zonked out it was great uh so then i got up and it was like after 10 o'clock and i was like oh my gosh i gotta i gotta put a show together and i don't like to try and rush it uh and I wanted to take a shower. So it's grungy. So here we are. It's a little bit late start uh, scheduled, but really work to get it on time. Rumble is still doing this weird thing where it seems to start like a minute after YouTube now. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just crazy. It doesn't matter ultimately. Uh, here we are. We're going. And uh, we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about uh, some big news today. Um, I was checking out the Fannie Willis thing. Uh, the decision on Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade has not come down from Judge McAfee yet in the Trump, Georgia, Fulton County election interference case. That hasn't happened, you know, for all the, you know, the whole fact that they were like banging each other and t going on vacations while they weren't supposed to. Um, the judge hasn't decided whether or not he should throw them out yet. And there's like weird uh, questions over who can hear about their ethics and all that shit. Uh, but all of that said. Mm, delicious. All of that said, uh, while I was checking it out, some huge news happened today. Judge McAfee actually tossed six counts uh, out of the election interference indictment. Now, there's a lot of counts. There's 41 total. Tossing six isn't the biggest thing in the world, but they are pretty fucking important counts. Uh, they're counts involving the solicitation of the violation of oath, I believe. Um, we'll get... Uh, We'll get into it as we as we go, and we may uh, take a peek at the order. But um, if there is a written order, I'm I'm not quite sure if there. Well, we can take a look at the uh, the original indictment if it's useful. But the solicitation of the violation of votes. This is the ones where they they said that the false electors that they asked them to violate their oath of office, and it all goes into these uh, the general idea about conspiracy and all that stuff. Judge says they just didn't even present uh, sufficient evidence to make the claim so these are gone um that's a big thing uh if you've been following the channel a long time having that happen mid-trial is uh is a pretty big win even if it's just a portion of the the entire case we saw it in kyle rittenhouse when uh judge schrader eventually after the after the uh state had rested he tossed out the carrying a firearm as a minor uh, charge against Kyle Rittenhouse because it wasn't actually the nature of the charge is one of the problems that the nature of the charge is not intended for that uh, for the allegations involved but also the state didn't present evidence that he did they never they never like asked to uh, get his age on the record in regards to carrying the the, the firearm so uh, the judge was able to throw it out I think the judge could have tossed it way earlier but he didn't because frankly Judge Schrader was kind of a coward in the Rittenhouse case I mean I know it turned out okay. But uh, he was kind of a coward on a lot of the motions in that case. Mm. 
If you're wondering, I'm consuming a delicious beverage. Uh, it's my favorite currently non-alcoholic beverage. It is a sweet tea and some sort of cream. In this case, it's a Fair Life whole milk. Um, I would prefer to use heavy whipping cream, but Fair Life whole milk. And then a splash of vanilla extract, pure vanilla extract. And it is, mm, mm, it's delicious. If you don't have uh, vanilla extract, you can use uh, vanilla almond milk. The sweetened vanilla almond milk is better for it. But yeah, it's it's great. So anyway, uh, that's what we got in this nice, uh, happy, well, and some ice because it's tea. This nice, lovely mug. It's good, uh, good stuff. But I haven't decided if I'm going to have a liquor drink tonight. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. I don't have anything in the morning. Hmm. Hmm. We'll decide later. Not a big deal. Um, <coughs> Okay, so we've got the six charges dropped against Trump. That's that's seriously, it's a huge win. I know, again, 41 counts total. I, I shouldn't say dropped against Trump. Dropped from the indictments, not just Trump who's involved. Um, but the six counts are dropped. We have this other crazy thing going on right now. It's crazy to me. It's really rare to see this happen. It's really rare to see this happen. We've got... Congress, the House of Representatives, has passed a strongly supported bipartisan bill to ban bipartisan bill to that's an alliteration bill to ban TikTok. TikTok has been controversial for quite some time. Um, and the controversy has shifted around. Right now, they're banning it under the stated cause of national security concerns due to a law in China that requires some Chinese or that requires Chinese companies to assist by compulsion and maybe even without disclosure the gathering of intelligence of the Chinese national government. Chinese national government is like not great. They're not great. Like they're. They're a, they're like a communist, fascist, hybrid government. They're really weird, but um, they're not a great source of like freedom and liberty. And so, with this, you have uh, <clears throat> you have this conflict because TikTok is a social media platform. It is quintessentially First Amendment protected activity for. Millions and millions of users, plus the company itself, operates in the United States under legal licensure. But when you have this allegation of it being a national security threat, you change the dynamic a little bit, unless that allegation is pretextual. Joe Biden has said he'll sign the bill into law if it's passed by the Senate. It had huge support, huge support from both sides, like 155 Republicans, 150 Democrats uh, supported this bill. So, I mean, this is like, um, you know, this is big, big time. And this is the biggest attack on TikTok yet. They've had a couple states attempt to ban TikTok and they've been rebuffed, I believe, by judges saying, yeah, First Amendment concerns me. You can't just ban this platform because you don't, you don't like it. And that's the problem. There's been a lot of chatter, uh, both in the political realm and the public zeitgeist, I guess, about how TikTok is a negative influence based on messaging that it sends to youths. Now, that is not the same as a national security threat. So the big question is going to be if this thing passes the Senate and gets signed by Biden, if he can remember where his pen is. Pen is? Pen? Pen? Penis. Uh, if he can remember where his pen is to sign, the, uh, to sign the document, if that happens, then TikTok is basically going to have to argue that this is pretextual. It's actually First Amendment suppression. Uh, they may have to prove out that they're not actually uh, compelled under this law. Um, the parent company of TikTok is a company called ByteDance. The CEO of ByteDance is the second wealthiest person in China. This is all, uh, you know, this is a big deal uh, because the U.S. is saying that TikTok is subject to this. I think TikTok has made statements that the United States branch of TikTok, effectively, the United States operation, is not subject to the Chinese government's rule on handing over user data. That's all well and good, but is it? We don't know. I know a bunch of people say that TikTok is Chinese spyware or Chinese spying software, and it very well may be. But the question isn't necessarily if they can do that. The question is, does Congress and the president have the power to ban this social media platform with a pretextual reasoning of national security when they've also talked about the messaging involved uh, at several levels. And um, even if the messaging weren't specifically 
sort of challenged. Um, it is still a social media app, which is, again, speech. So you're coming up against a massive First Amendment right, not just of TikTok, the American operation of TikTok, which does have that same right as a corporate person, but also everyone who uses it, including the employees of TikTok who keep it running, uh, who moderate the the content, all of that stuff. So, and the advertisers, advertise, like, uh, and then you, you've got to balance in, of course, the literal careers of millions of people some of them who make extremely lucrative amounts of money on TikTok, just like any other social media platform. So this is a big deal, a big deal. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth as we go as well. I hope that's an interesting subject for you. I know it's a fiery subject for many people because they don't like TikTok, but that's the problem. Not liking TikTok is not the same as it actually being uh, bannable. And it is weird to see people who generally support freedom or proclaim to um full-throatedly supporting authoritarian shutdown of a company so uh you know there are ways there are ways around this uh one actually congress has put up an ultimatum in the bill too which is this is not something i like to see from government it's a compelled action and it is for tiktok to basically sell itself away from its parent company, ByteDance, into the ownership of some other entity, presumably a United States entity that would be free from the Chinese uh, Chinese operation and the potential uh, owner, the potential uh, disclosure of user data to the Chinese government. I don't like governments compelling sales or demanding the sale of a company from one entity to another. I, I have fundamental problems with this. And a lot of people normally do. But when it comes to TikTok, everything gets special because TikTok's full of retards. I mean, that's the ultimate problem, right? The content on TikTok is horrifying to most people, not because it's like offensive, but because it's so damn stupid. And it's questionably uh, beneficial to anybody on earth and um it's unquestionably detrimental to uh, millions and millions of people just like every other social media platform but in particular tiktok is uh weird so um we'll talk about that as we go finally uh we will also be talking about uh the attorney general of minnesota the attorney general of minnesota is going after gun sales um particularly against a major retailer that i believe is rather unique to Minnesota called Fleet Farm. It's a uh, it's a farm supply company slash hardware store slash gun shop, fishing shop, all of that stuff. It's pretty cool for just kind of a outdoorsy Minnesota store. You know, it's got kind of what you need and they do sell firearms there. Well, one guy um, admitted to making 13 straw purchases through Fleet Farm uh, when he ended up making, uh, he admitted to making over 100 straw purchases of firearms. Uh, now the Attorney General of Minnesota is suing Fleet Farm. Actually, he started this case a couple years ago. Uh, he's suing Fleet Farm over the, um, over the straw purchases, saying that they should have known that these were straw purchases. So we'll... Uh, we'll be taking a look at that. This is not quite the same as going after specific gun retailers over like liability for uh, a gun used in a mass shooting or anything like that. But it's in the same vein, right? It's this idea that retailers um, or distributors or manufacturers or whoever are up the chain from the criminal act, but they're supposed to somehow police the criminal act on their own Otherwise, they're complicit. And this is a weird philosophical area that runs against Western common law and Western jurisprudence. This idea that um, if you fail to act in some way, you are now liable for the actions of someone else. Like if, or if you fail to act uh, to save someone, you're liable in some way for harm that comes to them. And compelling someone to act in a certain way should be the hardest thing for government to do. Preventing someone from acting in a specific way or punishing them for acting in a specific way is not a hard thing. We have restrictive action laws all over the place. Like don't go over the speed limit, right? Don't shoot someone in the face. Don't touch underage children. All of these things make sense. Don't do it. But to compel someone to do something, for the government to decide 
that you must do something by law is a step in an entirely different direction. And so while this is not the same character as, as trying to hold a gun manufacturer, for example, liable for a mass shooting that they have nothing to do with, they are trying to require Fleet Farm to enforce law that they don't really have the investigatory power to enforce, and it's a huge burden on them to attempt to do so. So how do we do this? But what's the ultimate goal? Is, is Keith Ellison really mad that Fleet Farm allowed this guy to straw purchase 13 guns? No. Keith Ellison is anti-gun uh, because he only beats his uh, spouses with his hands. He's anti-gun. And so what he wants to do is utilize any tool in his tool belt to make the acquisition, possession, purchasing, uh, use, carrying, bearing, keeping of arms more difficult in any way he possibly can. That's that's the goal of so many of these uh, lawsuits and prosecutions against gun manufacturers, distributors, and retailers is essentially it's just to sidestep the Second Amendment in any way they can and go after people uh, in a roundabout way. It's to prevent you from being, if they can punish Fleet Farm, and prevent them from being able to distribute guns or to make it uh, excessively more expensive for them to do so, thus, of course, passing the cost on to you. If they can do that, then they don't have to worry about your Second Amendment because they just can prevent you from acquiring the item in the first place. And this is the end run around the Constitution that is tried over and over again. So I hate it. Um, look, I don't want straw purchasers of guns. Isn't it funny to say that? Like, to act like you don't want straw purchases of guns. And you're like, well, you're saying you don't want people, you, you don't mind if you have people violate the law, right? Like, because if I say it's like, like well, I, I, I don't care about straw purchases. Do you guys care about straw purchases of guns? I don't give a shit. I'm going to say it right now, I don't give a shit. And if that's a controversial statement, you have to go to the original question is, wait, how do you straw purchase a gun? Oh, wait, that implies that you endorse a government restriction on gun purchases. Well, I don't. I never have. I don't support the government's ability to restrict gun uh, purchases in the first place. At the genesis, I find it unconstitutional to restrict the purchase of a firearm. So I don't give a shit if there's a straw purchase. Why should it matter? Why should that bother me? Oh, just because some jackass decided to write it down and call it a law? No, that doesn't that doesn't change my opinion. So have to be careful on some of this stuff when you're again talking conceptually and philosophically, because you run up to this point where you're like, well, I don't wanna, I don't want people to violate the law. It's like, but wait, is the underlying law just and reasonable in the first place? Well, no. Now, on this one, to me, this is actually specifically violative of the Constitution. So, um, no, so I don't care about it at all. Uh, let me, do, well, I'll just go ahead and say it. Attorney General Keith Ellison, fuck you. Eat shit. You're a pile of garbage. I hope you step down and have a long life in hell. All right, let's get into this fucking uh, show. That's the intro. I know I give long, wordy intros, but I like... Look, if people only want to watch the first 20 minutes and find out what I'm talking about and then go, holy shit, I'm out of here, go ahead. They're like, that's a that's kind of why I do it. Um, Richie F000 says, Richie F. Richie Foo says, are you moving to Texas yet? No, man, I, I kind of... I really... I really, really like my house and property here in Minnesota. I really do. I hate Minnesota. I hate it with a passion. God, if I could sledgehammer the state into ashes, I would. But that's when you hit the state so hard it catches fire. I would do that, but, um, you know, uprooting a whole family is really difficult uh, and uh, in, in, in a way traumatic to everybody involved. So I'm not super looking forward to that part. and. Um, you know, I, I really do. As far as places to live, I live in a great one in Minnesota. So I'm kind of here for a while. We'll never, we'll never know. Maybe at some point I'll get to leave here. Maybe not. We'll see. Shadow says, Riketa, if you will. A toast to Tim Pool's cat, Mr. Bocus. May he rest in peace. Oh, did he die? That's sad. 
I don't have a. Hold on, I don't have a. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do a little toast. I don't think I'm going to drink much tonight, so we'll keep it. Uh, we'll keep it very small, just for some toasts. Red Chief. Oh shit! Sorry. The uh, the one window that has my Rumble rants is um, remarkably. I should probably you know zoom in on it, but. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so here we go. Uh, Red Chiefs, thank you. So, Shadar, uh, as you request, a toast to Tim Pool's cat, Mr. Bocus. May he rest in peace. All nine lives given in service. Given in service to Tim Cast IRL. And uh, as a joke, of course, it's always sad when someone loses a pet, and Tim's a nice guy, so cheers to him. Uh, sorry for his loss. Okay, and we've got uh, Jim Satala. Glad you're feeling better. Just wondering, can a libertarian anarcho-capitalist use Canadian socialism to make a movie trailer to sell his comic book? Of course, if it's the most capitalistic way to do so. I have no idea. Look, man, the whole rip of stuff and the um, the questions around uh, the uh, Soska sisters or something. Is that what it is? That's weird shit. I have no fucking clue what's going on with um with that other than I see glimpses of it and I'm like, okay, Soska, Soska whatever. They, uh, I don't know, they seem to be like X, X, Wick, which Satan, X weirdos converted to Christianity right before the release of the book, the Iron Book, and they've done some questionable videos or something. I, I don't know. They're very strange. But I hope, I mean, I hope people like them. The book seems very popular, so go for it. Guys, go buy Yaira. If you're into, uh, if you're into indie produced comics, Eric July's latest release from the Ripaverse is Yaira. I believe a side character in the whole ISOM story, maybe. But I don't know because I didn't read any of them. So uh, if you like that, though, go check it out. It's doing very well. I think they've sold 13,000 books in the first like day or two. Uh, awesome job. Hope they make a million more dollars. The squid says, I don't give a F about straw purchases because all gun laws are unconstitutional. And the government has no place regulating anything to do with my ability to defend myself against anything. Damn fucking right, brother. That's exactly what I was getting to. Looking a little dark around the eyes. Well, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I am sleep deprived and I was uh, sleeping right before the show. So, well, not right before the show, about an hour before the show. Anyway. We'll get back into this stuff here. John H. Oh, shit. Says, my grandfather passed away last week. I will miss him and his stories. Rest in peace, Grandpa Buddy. Uh, John H., you didn't ask for a toast, but here we are. Cheers to you and your grandfather. Please, in his memory, uh, remember those good things he taught you. Remember his life stories. Remember the change that he watched the world undergo. And uh, remember that through all of that change and all of that turmoil, there was still just a man raising a family, carrying on a career, building the world closest to him and expanding his circle as far as he could go. May we all aim to do the same and have great influence on the next generation. Cheers. Thank you for that wonderful chat, John. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's get... Uh, Let's get into this. Judge throws out, woo, six counts of Trump's Georgia election interference indictment, indictment, indictment. The ruling is a win for Trump and several of his co-defendants. Of course, it's a win. Never stop winning. I'm always winning, wonderfully winning. Uh, now, as a reminder, Donald Trump has a couple pending issues before the Supreme Court. And one of them is whether or not a state can even prosecute a president if the president has... Um, immunity from official acts as president, which the argument, of course, is that all of the acts uh, Trump took in regards to the 2020 election are official acts. I mean, he is the president talking about a matter of extreme public concern. This is, this is huge. 
This is exactly and quintessentially in the role of a president who is the public's mouthpiece. The president represents the political will of the United States for a given period of time, which means that if the president is speaking to the United States about a matter, it is almost automatically a matter of public issue and public concern. His very voice indicates that it is, even if it's the wonderful, beautiful Mexicans who make the best taco bowls at Trump Tower or whatever, official communications and even many unofficial communications of a president of the United States that are recorded and reported to the people become matters of public interest, public concern. And if the president is speaking in a way where he knows he is being recorded and he knows he's addressing the populace, trying to claim that those acts are non-official is very, very difficult. Now, obviously, some presidents, Nixon, right, have utilized clandestine non-public speech in a way to attempt to further their own interests. We saw this with Watergate, uh, the recordings in the Oval Office that Nixon tried to claim were uh, official recordings of the president, but they were surreptitious recordings. They weren't public. They weren't ever intended to be public, and they were self-serving, and they were also used in, allegedly, the uh, conspiracy to commit criminal acts to secure an election, uh, oddly enough. One he probably didn't need to secure uh, because... He was, uh, he was slinging it way harder than the Democrat opposition. But that being said, we've seen that there, not every communication, every spoken word of a president or anything related to speech is always an official act. But it is a broad, broad protection. And it does need extreme levels of um, sort of support. And I, I guess I hate using protection twice. So I'm trying to look for another word, but uh, we'll say protection again from the Supreme Court and under the Constitution because the president needs to be able to speak the will of the public to the public with some level of assurance that he's not committing a crime by doing so. He needs to be able to investigate the things he's going to talk about, like the election, with some level of impunity and with some level of uh, freedom to act without, again, fear of prosecution. And in this case, yes, even potentially lining up alternative slates of electors. Now, I know this has gotten controversial for some people, and I really, uh, <clears throat> looking at you, Destiny, but that's maybe because Destiny listens to Pisco, who is quintessentially a moron. But... This idea of these alternative slates of electors being false electors, making false statements, is a big problem when you get down to the juice of what is exactly happening here. Because what is happening with the electors, this alternative electors, is this constitutional requirement for a slate of electors to be delivered at a certain time. You had the Republicans, Trump's uh, campaign specifically, attempting um all over the country to file lawsuits to challenge results that they believed to be inaccurate. So when you have that going and then you get no traction in the courts, you get nothing out of the courts at all. You get no support. In fact, you get told over and over that this is not the way to challenge this case. What you do then is you start going to other avenues. And what they did was they went to states specifically to state legislatures lobbying them. Hey, uh, we see this fraud here. We're, we're going to ask you guys to recall um, the electors that you sent to challenge your own results. We're sending you the research. We're doing this stuff. And in doing so, they did uh, either request, in some instances, maybe, or suggest, or maybe even organically allow people to get together under this, this idea that a slate of electors had to be delivered constitutionally on a specific date. Now, is that slate of electors the chosen slate of the state? Well, no. Does that make it a false slate of electors? Well, no, because no one thought that they were going to accidentally pick this slate of electors. It's an alternate slate of electors, and here's why. Simple lawyering, I guess, but it's really common sense. Here's why. If the state were to recall the slate of electors that were falsely determined if the claims about election interference, et cetera, were right, then they would need an alternate slate of electors. So you have this slate that is delivered saying, here, we're the alternate slate. We're the ones that would be here. Now, any number of things could go right or wrong with this plan. 
But what can't go wrong with this plan is an accidental selection of a stand-in uh, surreptitious slate of electors and everybody going, oh my God, how'd they do this? How'd they get in to cast their votes? Like that wouldn't, ha it's, it's so remarkably impossible that to consider it as a, as an attempted commission of a crime is, is almost insulting to everyone involved in that process. And that's why these, these claims of them being false electors in an attempt to undercut the election or undermine the election are so weird because you just have to ask to make someone pull their goddamn hair out and start uh, screaming at you in liberal speak. You just have to ask by what mechanism would the false slate of electors get accepted by the vice president and counted in as the official elector uh, tally for Trump. By what mechanism would this occur? And just, just watch them melt down trying to explain the way that everybody in line has to be retarded or criminal or whatever. They all have to do it, and all of these pieces has to fall into play. And America would never, like, would somehow not know. None of this would ever come to light, and it would just happen in the background. That's, everybody would have to be in on it. It's like that fucking Dana Carvey sketch when he talked about the OJ, uh, the OJ alleged murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and the other guy. Uh, when he's like, do you know how many people would have to be involved in the fucking conspiracy for this? And he's like, you know, talking about the president and going into the Navy and the Coast Guard and all this shit. Like, we're going to frame OJ, you in? Type thing. It's, it's, it's an insane prospect. And yet they adhere to it. They're like, of well, of course this could happen. What do you mean, of course this could happen? Show me when it happened before. Like, how is this snuck in? Well, well, oh my God, these electors just came in. They just came in to, look, I just I just tripped and fell inside of her. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to cheat. Like, what? What? Who believes? Oh, yeah. Pisco does. I guess Destiny does. And uh, anyone who just doesn't think about it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <coughs> Got a couple chats. Texas Red 512 says, what do you think about Sadie Henwood, the possible replacement for uh, Fannie Willis? Henward? Sadie Henward? Is that a fake? Is that a fake name? I have no idea. I haven't been following the possible replacement. Sadie, Hen Sadie Henward. Okay. You put two D. If it was one D, I would that would have been Sadie. You said Sandy. Uh, Long Dong John says, government, ban TikTok. The Chinese are using it to spy on our citizens. Also government. Hey, Facebook, Twitter, and Google, spy on our citizens harder. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Um, TikTok, TikTok acting as a Chinese spy company, uh, the government has alleged that TikTok might potentially disclose user data to the Chinese government when requested. Okay? The United States government takes user data from every social media company all the time. Just constantly. They, they do it forever. They, they haven't even alleged that it's happened on TikTok. But they do it every time, like, unendingly, uh, here in the U.S. So that is a nice little inconsistency. I guess it's not really an inconsistency, but it's a nice little funny observation about the reality of the United States government and how they act. Uh, Smegman Bukaki 69 says, did you really tell Ethan Ralph there's no law against masturbating over people's graves? That's messed up, bro. Uh, no, I don't believe Ethan Ralph asked me about uh, masturbating over people's graves. But um, I don't know. There is, you know... You, I guess you could go look for the law about masturbating over people's graves. I think what you have to do to get there, I don't, I haven't researched it because again, the main answer to your question is no. Um, but I guess to get to there, you tend to have to get to a question of like defiling uh, the grave in some way. And people often misunderstand what defacing or defiling uh, or desecrating a grave actually is. Um, they, they tend to misunderstand the language there, which tends to have a definition that you can look up either in the, the statute itself or sometimes you have to go to the case law based on the state. Uh, it would vary by state. Um, also, generally, there are laws against public masturbation in most states. That would be uh, on its own, probably sufficient. But I've never been asked a question, so I've never fully looked into it. I know there is a question about peeing on a grave. 
uh, or Gravestone um, that came out early in the Ripperverse thing, but that wasn't asked by Ethan Ralph. That was asked by uh, people about someone from the Dick Show, or Riley or something. Someone like uh, pretended to pee on the grave or something. I don't know. I don't remember the specifics, but I know we talked about that on the show. So you can go back and look it up. Mm. Dagnar says the anti TikTok bill uh, also has in it where feds can pull data from every, anyone's devices. No, they wouldn't do that. Killdozer, can I masturbate on my own grave? Yes, but bring lube. It's a little dry. <laughs> MVC says, duh, one does not jag it over a grave. A gentleman digs a small hole in the grave and jag it inside the grave. Gets some ethics. Wait, why, would, why wouldn't you just pound the hole? MVC, can't you be courteous? Maybe the grave wants some too. Maybe it doesn't like to watch. It wants to be involved. Dig the hole and then just pound it straight in. Good Lord. <laughs> All right, here we go. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> Sleeping Psycho says, wouldn't that be public exposure? So typically, <clears throat> I think the law is typically called public indecency, uh, but maybe public exposure. But those laws, okay, uh, usually require a, a quote-unquote victim. Exposure laws or indecency laws tend to require a victim, which would be usually a living witness who is unwilling, right? Like, in theory, you can walk around with your pants down anywhere if no one sees you. That's not legal advice. Don't do that. It's in, in theory, but the moment someone sees you and is not consenting to it, and it's not an appropriate place to be. If you're walking around with your genitals hanging out, like then you've uh, exposed yourself to someone in violation of the law at that point. But if there's no one around, technically you're not violating the law because there's no one, there's not a victim, right? So just uh, being alone at a gravesite naked, theoretically, wouldn't violate an, a public exposure law. And again, how would anyone know if there's no victim? Like, would you turn yourself in? Because if you like a mirror, like, well, I was naked hanging out at a graveyard. And uh, I looked at myself in my mirror and I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. So I called the police on me. Maybe. I mean, Fanny Willis would have to do that, I think, based on looking at her. So that's, uh, that's that. But yeah, remember, criminal acts have to have, I shouldn't say have to, typically have some sort of victim uh, even if that victimhood is somewhere up the chain or maybe conceptual but like just a physical act that's like if you punch at the air uh, didn't you assault someone like somewhere down wind of it and like no not really so uh, I would say no on that but again if someone was there uh, that could be different or if you record it and then uh, send it to someone that's obviously a that can be completely different as well. There's a whole lot of things that can make non-criminal acts criminal or criminal acts non-criminal, depending on the circumstances. And that's why trials occur, right? Like the facts matter. So it's it's uh, making blanket statements on the law in general is tough, even though it's a blanket statement, because um, the facts of any specific case are so damn critically important to uh, the actual outcome and the actual question of whether or not a law is violated. Okay, so back to this story that I abandoned. A long time ago. Car could cops be living witnesses? Uh, like, can they be? Well, if they're there, yeah. So a Fulton County judge on Wednesday quashed. He quashed. I want some quashed potatoes. Multiple counts contained in the election interference indictment against former President Donald Trump and several of his co-defendants. The, the order from Judge Scott McAfee dismissed six counts related to specific charges. Solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer. That charge specifically relates to Trump's January 2nd, 2021 phone call to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, which in part sparked the probe. Oh, did it? Really? The January 2nd, 2021 phone call? Remember, this is the genesis of this entire case. It's the linchpin. It is the public-facing evidence that was used to hammer Donald Trump for years and years and years and used as the basis of this lawsuit, claiming that Donald Trump was asking people to cheat, asking them to find votes, asking them to interfere in an election. But he didn't, though. And I'm not sure how people miss this because 
He never did. Like, he never actually asked for Now, I know. If you take one specific, like, 10-second clip of the phone call, you say, we just need to find 11,261 votes or whatever it is. He says that. Yes, he does. But it's in the question. It's in the context of we have a discrepancy in vote totals. We see something like, I think he says something like 40,000 more votes for us than Biden in our data, in our review of what's available. We want your information to verify the numbers because we show me winning by 40,000. Now, I only need this many to win, so we really only need to find this many votes. But this is what we're seeing. That's the basic context of the question. It's been misrepresented and twisted. And of course, uh, people don't look into it. We listened to the whole fucking phone call on the channel. And when I heard that, I was like, well, that's that didn't he didn't ask him to find anything illegally at all. He just said, this is what we're looking for because here's the data we have. This is what we need. So if we find this many, it's sufficient. But he didn't ask anybody to find anything illegal. They're literally saying we have this. We're we're trying to figure out where the discrepancy is. Why is our why are our numbers different than yours? We want to look at your stuff. And they said no. Uh, Raka Hora says, "What the fuck are so many First Amendment supporters pushing to legislate uh, extra powers to any uh, president of the United States, but especially this president that has repeatedly twisted laws to bring novel attacks on his opposition? Because the children." Oh my gosh, she's just spamming in the thing. Go away. How the babies are going. I don't know how, how the babies are going. All right, here we go. Back to this. So of the 13 counts Trump faced, three of them were tossed by the judge's order. Trump now faces 10 counts in the case. So right, there, the, uh, the solicitation to violate uh, the oath, there were six of those. Three of those pertain to Trump. Uh, three of them pertain to other defendants like Rudy Giuliani, et cetera, et cetera, in other uh, portions of this thing. The ruling is a partial win for Trump and several of his co-defendants who filed to dismiss the counts on the grounds that they were legally deficient. Judge McAfee essentially agreed, writing that they failed to allege sufficient detail on exactly what part of the oath the defendants were allegedly trying to get public officials to violate. He said the lack of detail concerning an essential legal element is fatal. Uh, well, yeah. You have, to, you have to allege facts sufficient to support every element of a crime so that the defendant has the opportunity to respond to the alleged facts that are used as evidence against them. Mm. God's fucking delicious. Okay. Quote, they do not give the defendants enough information to prepare their defenses intelligently. That's what I was just saying. As the defendants could have violated the constitutions and thus uh, the statutes in dozens, if not hundreds of distinct ways, uh, the order says. But the ruling left in place the most serious charge of the indictment, the racketeering charge that all 15 of the remaining defendants face, which, yes, Rico, Rico, the judge gave the Fulton County District Attorney's Office six months to refile the quash charges if they choose to do so. The DA's office declined to comment to ABC News. Of course, they have a fundamental problem. Having the opportunity to refile begs the question of, why aren't you throwing your A game at the beginning, right? This is a criminal prosecution. It's one of the most high profile possible criminal prosecutions that you can muster. And you've just left out elements of six major charges why why didn't you so maybe they can refile it sure but can they will they be able to allege sufficient facts to support the claims i don't know you know i doubt it because i i just don't have a ton of faith in prosecutors in general um i have a lot of faith in the system to uh, molly coddle prosecutors in their deficiencies all over the place but that being said why don't you have this locked down I think the difficulty there is trying to figure out what that charge is about in the first place. Like, and again, that this is essentially what, the judge, what did they actually ask them to violate? I guess they asked them to violate quote unquote, their duty to the constitution of the state of Georgia, but how, like, how did they ask them to do that? I need you. I need you to show me where they said, I need you to do this. I need you to violate the constitution of Georgia, not explicitly state that, but I need you to do this action, which will violate your oath. What action is it? Where is it? Where did they ask them to do it? Just because they uh, 
allegedly engaged in a criminal organization or enterprise for the purposes of overturning the election doesn't mean that they actually asked someone to do something that would violate their oath. That's a specific that's a specific thing. Even if someone ultimately violated their oath in response to something that they asked or in response to some course of action that was taken, that still doesn't mean they asked them to. Like, that's soliciting them to actually do it. That tends to be a more direct request. Uh, me, 04120, says, Rico, was Trump part of Rackets, Raggeteers? Yes, uh, I'll admit it right now. I'm actually the mastermind um, of the Trump-Rico uh, organization. Uh, to subvert the election, also uh, to defame Montegraff. Mm. All right. So here we go. Uh, the DA's office declined to comment. The, me the motions called demurs were brought by Trump, his former attorney Rudy Giuliani, former chief of staff Mark Meadows, election lawyer John Eastman, and others. Wednesday's order by the judge quashes three of the 13 counts against Giuliani, who no longer faces two counts of solicitation, one count of false statements and writings according to the order. The conduct underpinning those now dropped counts dates back to December 2020 when Giuliani made three public appearances at hearings before Georgia state lawmakers, one in the Georgia House of Representatives and two in the Georgia Senate, where he aired unfounded allegations of fraud in the 2020 elections and encouraged lawmakers to assign a false slate of electors. Giuliani now faces 10 counts in the Fulton County indictment. The judge's order quashes one of the two counts against Meadows, who now faces one count, the racketeering or RICO count that all 19 defendants were charged with, quashes one of the nine counts against Eastman, three of the 12 counts against uh, Georgia lawyer Roy, Ray Smith III, and one of the 10 counts against Georgia lawyer Robert Cheeley. Multiple defense attorneys in the case praised the ruling. Uh, the court made the correct legal decision to grant the special demurs and quash important counts of the indictment brought by DA Fannie Willis. Trump attorney Steve Sanow said in a statement, the ruling is a correct application of the law as the prosecution failed to make specific allegations of any alleged wrongdoing on these accounts. Don Samuel, a lawyer for Smith, who filed the original demurrer, said in a statement to ABC News that he was delighted with the court's ruling. Ben Frail says, why do you think he's called the Don? <laughs> you, come to me, you come to me here? The day of my daughter, daughter's wedding, Ivanka, very beautiful, wonderful, wonderful girl, terrific, uh, very nice legs or whatever. You come to me on the day of, of Ivanka, you ask me to do this thing, these false elector things you asked me to do. Uh, quote, we believe this is the first step to exonerate Ray of all the charges. Samuel said a few more counts to go. Trump and 18 others pleaded not guilty last August to all charges in a sweeping racketeering indictment for alleged efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election in the state of Georgia. Defendants Kenneth Ch Chesbro, Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, and Scott Hall subsequently took plea deals in exchange for agreeing to testify against other defendants. The former president has blasted the DA's investigation as being politically motivated, which it obviously was. Obviously was politically motivated. If there's any question about that, I don't know what to tell you. Um, it's a quintessentially political issue going on, the quote-unquote overturning of a presidential election. Uh, it's being prosecuted by the opposition that won the election against the person who claimed there was fraud. Uh, the former, the former president, the former or the predecessor to the current president is being prosecuted by the current president uh, over the attempts to retain the presidency, al alleging that the current president uh, is only there due to election fraud. So, of course, it's politically motivated. There's no question about it. And when you couple in the fact that everybody on the side of the uh, Fulton County case is similarly aligned to the president of the United States politically, in fact, endorsing the president of the United States, I believe, donating to the president of the United States, uh, all of that has occurred. Um, you know, you, you kind of go, how can this not be political? Like, by what measure is something political if this isn't it? It's uh, it's a good question. So, all right. Um, that said, you know, this is, uh, how do we, how do we close out this topic? This is the process by which a criminal prosecution occurs, of course. Uh, the state makes its case. The state fails to make its case by a certain time. The judge drops the, drops the charges if you ask nice, it drops the charges for which they failed to make the case. They can bring them back, maybe. 
But you have to ask why they failed to make the specific allegations necessary to have the charges stick in the first place. Now, I know what some people are going to say. Well, these solicitation things aren't big deal. It's it's the RICO. It's the racketeering, uh, et cetera. The, these counts are the more important counts. Yada, yada, yada. Of course, yes. The RICO counts. But remember, the concept of a racketeering criminal organization. The concept is that some group of people exist in an organized manner for the purposes of committing specific criminal acts, right? Like uh, bootlegging, for example, like a bunch of people in, you know, creating um, illegal liquor, importing illegal liquor, distributing it. And then, of course, all of the criminal acts around protection or intimidation that were involved in uh, in maintaining their business territory. Um, or the same thing with, uh, with street gangs right now, distributing drugs, uh, either meth or heroin or fentanyl or crack or whatever it is, right? Um, as they uh, you have the manufacturing arm, the distribution arm, uh, the retail arm, and then the enforcement arm. Um, all of these acts organized around a central group of people become a criminal organization, whether formalized and official or unofficial but practical, right? So you have this idea. The big news about this, the big sort of takeaway from this is the 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 quashing of any of these charges, any amount of them runs into this very serious question about the underlying criminal organization. With each criminal act that gets removed from the organization's list of sins, you have to go, well, what were they attempting to do then as a criminal organization or enterprise? With each act that goes away, that leaves less and less criminal acts that they were engaged in as a focused enterprise. So what is it? Do we eventually get down to just one count of conspiracy over one act? Are there any acts? Do we even know? This is a criminal organization uh, or enterprise that has no list of criminal acts attached to it. Where does it start and where does it end? Um, these, uh, these RICO, these RICO claims, like this one, it's 98 pages long. It's full of all of these different things that had to have occurred for the violations that they're stating. They're these giant sweeping documents because they're trying to show the justice system, including the jury, it's going to sit there, trying to show them that this is an enterprise or organization with a multifaceted goal of ongoing criminality around a certain concept, in this case, overturning the election. But it can't just be like one phone call would not be sufficient for, re like it technically would, but do you believe like it's an, Massive criminal enterprise for this one phone call that Trump took? No, no, no. You have to get into all this other stuff. Well, they're trying to induce the violation of an oath. They're trying to uh, induce fraud from these people. They're trying to uh, get people to violate or to perjure themselves. They're, they've got this intimidation arm around politics to get someone to uh, find illegal votes or force a recount. They have to do all of this stuff and they have to bring all of these counts to attempt to effectively sell you on the idea that this is a giant operation or more appropriately, I guess, a focused op operation for the purpose of committing crimes. And if you can't show a bunch of crimes, it doesn't really look like it. It might look like a bunch of people acting around a certain thing and maybe a crime occurred somewhere, maybe not. But if their RICO case falls apart because the list of offenses and sins starts to get whittled away, that's going to be a big loss for the prosecution. Even in the psychological or philosophical argument for the jury of how do we have a criminal enterprise or operation if there aren't any crimes or if there aren't that many crimes? What if they can't prove a couple of them? What if, what if it gets down to they can maybe, they maybe prove out one or two criminal acts did they get the RICO to stick? Like, can they show that everybody was actually acting in concert? These are the big questions. And having any of these charges uh, start to get dropped or whittled away, that's all very big news in this type of prosecution. So good job, I guess. Go uh, Trump lawyers and other lawyers on the side there. But uh, this ultimately, of course, is still predicated on the idea that this case is going to stick around for two main reasons. 
One, the judge may rule that Fannie uh, Willis and Nathan Wade are out due to their alleged inappropriate, uh, inappropriate conduct regarding their romantic relationship. So that's one way. If they get tossed, the case still technically goes on and they can assign a new prosecutor to it. But it takes the wind out of the sails. It makes it look like a political prosecution. Pursuing the prosecution after the fact may look really bad publicly. It may look really bad to a jury. Um, they may just not really have the resources to get the next team up to speed. And they might just drop the case. Uh, that sometimes happens. This is a huge case, major public case, and it's against a former president. So I'm not, you don't get to follow the regularly scheduled sort of conceptual rule book. It's not really a rule, but, but like an idea book about how the justice system works because it doesn't usually work in these contexts. It's not a thing that we tend to see. So you don't know what's going to happen if it does get dropped. Or if, uh, Fa well, Fannie Willis is in it. Nathan Wade, yeah, him too. If Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade get dropped, the only thing we know is that they will crater heavily into the ground. So with that said, it's hard to say uh, what will happen with the ongoing case, though. Um, a lot of times when prosecutors removed, the case kind of just fades away. But in this one, it's Donald Trump. It's massive, uh, major public news. It is politically motivated, at least in some stretch. Even if it's properly politically motivated, it's still important to a lot of people. So they may keep it going. But we'll find out well, whenever the judge issues his order on uh, Nathan Wade and Fannie Willis what happens next. But the other reason is that Trump has his immunity claim going before the Supreme Court. And it's very, very possible uh, that the Supreme Court will find that Trump is immune from official acts, that this will have to go back to determine if these were official acts of the president. I think they fall under what we would consider the uh, outer perimeter of official acts, which is what the civil immunity um, jurisprudence around a president entails. If they follow that model, it's very likely that all of this stuff would be considered in the outer perimeter of the official uh, acts of a president in regards to Donald Trump. And that doesn't say anything for anybody else in the case. Nobody else would be, quote unquote, immune there. And they may find a giant criminal operation for everybody else, but Trump would be uh, essentially dismissed out due to his immunity. Although it may limit their, some of the evidence they're able to bring in the case. That's a more complicated question. But if that's the case and they still prosecute everybody else and not Trump, he's ostensibly prosecuted by association and by involvement. Um, and that may be enough of a win for them anyway. But it is a really interesting question that's going before the Supreme Court on whether or not this case can even include Donald Trump uh, or if he's immune from it. If he's immune from it, some of the evidence, some of the statements, some of the acts may also be similarly inadmissible. And that may tear down the entire case as well. So we'll have to see uh, on that. That's uh, coming up in the Supreme Court. Kate C., a.k.a. Snake Plush Kitten, says, If Trump is elected, could his attorney general charge Fannie and Posse with RICO committing election interference? a good question, isn't it? Maybe. I don't know. The rules are fucking out. The rules are, the rules are out on this. And the reason the rules are out on this, let me be very clear here, is because of the unprecedented nature of what's going on in regards to these political prosecutions and political uh, accusations, or I guess legal accusations against a former president uh, while, for acts undertaken as president. Um, everything about Trump and all of these cases against him, all of the legal actions going against him right now invoke serious questions around whether uh, anybody has the authority to do this under the Constitution. The executive power is a massive power of government. Uh, some would say it's the second highest power of government after uh, the legislative power. Um, some would say it's the first, that it is the highest power. And having the executive power infused into one person for a period of time with given limited limitations means something. And what it means is that this person is, it's representing, a, I, I keep saying this, the manifest political will of the country at a, at a, at a pinpoint on the timeline. And that manifest political will is important. And it needs to be able to act and it needs to be voiced and it only should be constrained against infringing on essential liberties protected by the constitution. Other than that, you kind of got to let it go. And when people talk about no one being above the law and 
whatever. No, that's part of the law. And it's why the president enjoys a lot of leeway in how he acts, who he talks to and what he does, because he has to, because he doesn't, you can say what you want about presidents, but they do represent our choice. And that choice includes how they're going to act for the next four to eight years. That is our choice to make. That's our right. We've given it to ourselves in this fucking document. And you don't get to just take it away by being some uh, some county prosecutor with a political boner the size of fucking Empire State Building that you know she pegs Nathan Wade with. All right, that being said, guys, I think uh, we've kind of closed off that topic. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me through it. We're going to flip over to Rumble exclusively now. I appreciate that. If you're on YouTube, please join us over on Rumble. Also, please uh, click the like button on your way out on YouTube. Either way, whether you're joining us or not, great to see so many of you here. Come join the thousands more over on Rumble. And we will be uh, we will be going into that Congress versus TikTok uh, topic next. And then, of course, Minnesota and the gun sales after that. I will take a short break after we switch to Rumble to let people uh, filter in over there and also to give me a chance to go to the bathroom, uh, see how Lady Rackets is doing, and then I will be right back. So thanks for watching tonight, guys. Hope you're enjoying the show. Hope you enjoy the topics and hope you pop over to Rumble with me where we can say the F slur so many times. And by that, I mean Fanny Willis. Oh my God, demonetize. Catch you there, guys. Peace. Peace.